Father in heaven, we thank you again for putting it on our hearts to come and study your word. Make it uh, first and foremost in our lives. And Father, we come to you humbly recognizing our great need of understanding of your ways. We've been filled with the world's ways and we recognize that it's time to unload that information. We ask, Father, that you cleanse our hearts and our minds. May your spirit work in us to lead us and guide us into all truth. We pray in Yeshua's name. Amen. The biggest part of, of, uh, of course, Daniel 9 was the, the 77s that they were going to go back and build the temple uh, to the coming of the Messiah. So when we go back to Jeremiah, we see these promises of the coming of the Messiah. In fact, let's just jump around just a little bit, um, just, to, just to show you that. Those that some of you are familiar with Jeremiah, and that's, that's wonderful. Jeremiah is, a, is actually a pretty important book for, for end time for, for different reasons. Uh, but uh, Jeremiah talks about the coming of the Messiah, among other things. Uh, let's go to Jeremiah chapter 23, just for an example here. Um, Jeremiah did talk about the Messiah. Here's a, a very good example of that. There's lots of other places where he talks about the Messiah. Um, verse 5 in, in chapter 23 In uh, verse 5, Behold, the days are coming, says Jehovah, that I will raise up to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell, dwell safely. Now this is the name by which he will be called, the Lord our Righteousness. So this is a, a prophecy of the Messiah. And as we've been looking at, and it's, it's really interesting how we've all come to conclusions on what the truth is. And not one of us is in the same place as far as what the truth is. And that's just the reality. So we've, gotta, we've really got to cut each other slack, especially if we think we're going to be able to stay together as a body. Of believers because there's not two believers that believe identically on on each each issue we're all coming to a realization of what the truth is and part of God's plan is that we work together um, do you guys know what a rock tumbler is you guys you know yeah. what a rock do you guys have rock tumblers in Australia I don't know yeah I got one. I've got one you, you've got one Okay, yeah. tell us what a rock tumbler is. You know, you put, uh, you can find rocks, so I use it with polish and resin as well. Um, you put some uh, sandpaper like polish, real fine grit in it, a little bit of water, and then you turn it on electric or batteries or whatever, and uh, it rotates for hours and hours and polishes those rough stones up. Okay, how many, how many, how many? How many stones do you put in there together? Um, well, it depends on, if they're real heavy, you can't put too many. I think you're only supposed to put like maybe about a third, a third of what the barrel is, you know, whatever size you can get different Okay, barrels. so it's whatever size you have, you can put that many rocks yeah. in. So, so that's what the body of Yeshua is. We're living stones. We're told we're living stones. And we've been put in close contact with each other. And lo and behold, we're grinding off the rough edges of each other. Now, I can only imagine that those stones inside that tumbler, if they had feelings, they'd probably be getting hurt now and again. I don't know. What do you think? Yes. So, so the idea is, the idea is when we are in close contact and when, when I believe what God has done, he's, he's called us to assemble together, 
to be close to each other, to grind those rough edges off each other. And that isn't in the terms of roughness, but it's in love. And, and so he's brought us together. And what happens in a body, and I've seen this, it's happened in, in our fellowships over the years in di at different times, in different places, is that somebody will bring something to the front and just because everyone doesn't buy into it, that then they have to leave because, okay, you guys have just said, no, I don't believe that. And if you don't believe that, then you're a heretic and, and that. God's word tells us in Hebrews, don't forsake the assembly of yourselves together, especially as you see the day approaching. And, you know, it's just so important that we, we work together to help each other get to the other side. This is what we lose sight of. Our, our proximity of each other sometimes is a little uncomfortable, but we're there to help each other get to the other side. I'm convinced that it's all going to be worth it once we get there. Uh, but anyways, uh, how did I get there from where we were talking about the Messiah? I guess, I guess the Messiah is the glue that holds us together, a proper understanding of the Messiah. So in Jeremiah... Jeremiah was shown clearly the Messiah would come, but he wasn't shown when he would come. Now, this is the issue, and I'm just going gonna, gonna to sort of ramble here for a minute, because we're seeing all kinds of ideas out there in the Messianic world. People are reading um, a lot of Jeremiah, a lot of Isaiah, a lot of Ezekiel, and they're applying those prophecies to today. Now, there are some aspects of it, but when you, when you lift entire passages out, like almost entire chapters out, and remove it from its context, and make it say something that it's not saying, it's, it's leading people down paths that we don't understand where, where they will lead. The reality of it is Satan uses scripture to lead people to destruction. Imagine that. God has allowed Satan to do that. If we don't have the spirit that inspired the prophets helping us through this, we're not going to make it. There's nobody that's smart enough. And this is a point that I'm really coming to grips with. There is no one in the world that's smart enough to figure out these prophecies. And, and this is one of the reasons why I wanted to look at Jeremiah 25, because Jeremiah 25 is a classic example of how God has given prophecy. The main point of Jeremiah 25, let's, let's go there. The main point, and we're just going to sum this up because we want to, we want to carry these thoughts forward into uh, where we're going to go here. And we were going to go into uh, Jeremiah 29, but then I got reading some other things in Jeremiah and I thought, wow, there is so much in Jeremiah that we really need to, uh, to be able to see clearly because that helps us in the time of the end when when people are claiming that these prophecies are being fulfilled. So let's look at Jeremiah 25. And uh, we saw in there that the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. And then we get into down into verse 11. He's warning Israel to repent. Um, because God could even turn things around. And then he says in verse 11, And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Then it will come to pass when the 70 years are completed, verse 12, that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity. 
says the Lord, and I will make it a uh, perpetual desolation. So here we have the 70-year prophecy. And then let's just, for the sake of time, um, drop down to verse 26. All the kings of the north. So this is now when God's going to punish the other nations. And all the kings of the north, far and near, with one another, and all the kingdoms of the world, which are on the face of the earth. So we go from the... From the, the 70 years of captivity, and then we go to the punishment of Babylon, and then we go to the punishment of, ultimately, it goes through and names all these different kings that are going to be punished, and then it completes it by saying that all the kingdoms of the earth. So we go from the captivity, basically, to the end of the world, all in one chapter. And so, wow. And we've eclipsed in this chapter the Messiah, except in verse 30, that's the first we see of the Messiah after the return of the captivity. It says, therefore prophesy against them all these words and say to them, the Lord will roar from on high and utter his voice from his holy habitation he will roar mightily against his fold. He will give a shout as those who tread the wine or tro tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. Has this happened yet? No. No. So this is the problem we have in prophecy. This is why I, I keep saying that unless you understand what coming it's talking about and put it in its proper place, it, it's a, it's a crapshoot. And I don't mean to say that in a disrespectful or an irreverent reverent way. It's that this is the way the Spirit of God inspired the book and inspired the prophets. So obviously, in my mind, it is God's method to help us understand without his spirit, we're going to get it wrong. There's no way we can get this thing right unless we have his spirit helping us. So somebody help me understand how we can go from the 70 years to the second coming, which was uh, approximately 2,600 years. How do we get to, from the captivity in 605 to where Yeshua is returning uh, in, in 2,600 years in one chapter, as if it happens bang, 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 bang. And so when people are reading prophecy, they seem to lose the concept of that, is what God did for the Jews is he, he gave them admonition for their time, and then he said, oh, by the way, uh, the Messiah is going to come back. Yeah, okay, that's good. But then he's going to roar from on high. He's not telling them when that's going to happen. He's just telling them it's going to happen. And so when Daniel is given these prophecies, and he's reading Jeremiah, my question is, how did Daniel put time frames on this? Would Daniel have expected that the Messiah would come shortly after they came back from, from Babylon? Yeah. I can't Probably. see any other way than he would have thought that he was that they were going to build this temple. And the Messiah, in fact, in Daniel chapter 9, it seems that Daniel was a little shocked that it was going to be another 490 years because they were all thinking, oh, we're going to go back and rebuild the temple and the Messiah is going to come. And God says, well, wait a minute, it's going to be another 490 years. And we're told in the book of Hebrews that Abraham looked for a city whose builder and maker was God. And then in chapter 15 of Genesis, 
Abraham has a nightmare. And part of that nightmare was the time frame that they were going to be four generations down in Egypt and become slaves. And for Abraham, that was a real nightmare. Because he thought when he left Ur of the Chaldees, he was going to the promised land. And he well, never did funny. get there, really. Um, yeah, it's funny. It's and funny you so, mentioned Abraham. I was actually... Pardon me? I was actually thinking, it was funny you mentioned Abraham. I was going to say the same thing. Also, when he was promised to have uh, a child at old age, you know, when you read it, you think it's kind of happening quick. But I think it was like 80 years later before he actually had the, the promise. Yeah, it was so, the son of promise was a long time coming. Yeah. 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 Yeah, exactly. So God, he has a way of not help, not letting us uh, know the time frame. He tells the event, but he doesn't give the time frame for the event. So here we have, here we have the challenge in Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. And, and I'm just referring to the Old Testament prophets now. Um, God gave the promises that Jerusalem would be the headquarters of worship, that people would dwell safely forever. And he uses the word forever, no more. You know, they'll, they'll um, turn their, their swords into pruning shears and, and all the rest of it. And so people are thinking that those prophecies are being fulfilled. But we know, according to the rest of the story, and this is where if we don't see the rest of the story, we get confused as to what God has gone before. But we know the final battle is not and it's called the Battle of Armageddon. Uh, and and um, what uh, the terminology there in, in Revelation 20 uh, calls it the Battle of, yeah, Four Corners, Gog and Magog. And so there's a Gog and Magog battle in Ezekiel. And people are thinking that the Gog and Magog battle is... Uh, just prior to when Yeshua comes. But according to the book of Revelation, the Gog and Magog battle is not until after the millennium. So this is, this is the problem that we're facing in prophecy. People are, are grabbing different prophecies and they're saying, this is going to happen here, and this is going to happen here, and this is going to happen here. And it's just an absolute chaos. And there's as many stories as there are prophets. Um, and I use that term rather loosely uh, because that's what it is. It's a pretty loose term these days. But anyways, we get to um, verse 33 in chapter 25, and it says, And in that day the slain of the Lord shall be from one end of the earth even to the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented or gathered or buried they shall become refuge on the ground. So, okay, now this sets some context for the time of Yeshua. So, this is why when the Jews were expecting Yeshua to come, they were expecting him to do this, because that's the way the prophecies read. And so they were expecting him to wipe out the Romans, to take the throne, and rule the nations with a rod of iron. That's what they were expecting. And that's because the prophecies read that way. However, 2020 hindsight tells us that they weren't fulfilled that way. And so the Jews, not being led by the spirit of prophecy... We're getting things wrong. Now, this is a lesson that if we don't learn today, we are going to fall into the same traps that the Jews did. And somebody says, well, how do you know you're not falling into that trap? Well, the fact is, I don't. And so we have to test all things. We have to try and learn as many lessons from the past so that we don't have to repeat them. And uh, that's what I've been trying to do, is learn these lessons that people failed in 
uh, especially at the first coming, but I'm seeing that people are repeating the same lessons of the past. Now we're going to we're going to look at some concepts here that are actually a little bit comical. Uh, but they are they are lessons. We can learn some lessons from them so that we don't have to repeat them today. So um, any questions before we move forward on uh, on our study tonight? So the Gog and Magog in Ezekiel is the same Gog and Magog that's in the book of Revelation? Are, is that, are you telling me or, asking, or asking me? I'm asking you. Okay, yeah, I, I did depict a little bit of a higher <laughs> note at the end of your, your sentence. So um, <laughs> that's a really good question. What do you think? I would think that the two were connected. I, I don't know why. I just feel that the two are supposed to be connected. I, I guess that's something I'm going to have to read up on. Well, uh, does anyone have some thoughts? I'm, I'm, I'm getting... Uh, we could... You know what? That's a really good question. And it has everything to do with what we're studying. It's a little bit off topic, but it's on topic at the same time. So I think it, I think it might be worth our effort to explore that for a few minutes. Does anyone want to add some? Somebody get this. Give that some thought. Somebody add some comments. I'm going to get the board here. Now I've I've done this illustration before, sometimes uh, a little different way, but. Um, this is a this is a kind of a concept um, that if if uh, I don't not sure how to do this here I'm just going to uh, do this um, okay so can you guys see that okay yeah yes okay so. So the quickest, the quickest way to get from A to B would be what? A straight line. Nice. That was a tough question, wasn't it? So a straight yes. line. So um, do you think that you could change a decision that you made in your life and get to A to B quicker? Have you made bad decisions? Let me say this. Let me ask that question. Have you made a bad decision that has sort of led you around a couple turns that maybe it would have been nicer if you didn't have to make? You could have got somewhere Absol quicker. I think everybody has. Sure. Absolutely. Sure. So even in our spiritual walk, that's the way it works. If we make a bad decision, we can go down a road, and depending on how bad it is, um, it can take us down a path that we could really regret. And, and God doesn't remove those decisions from us. He, give, he enlightens us. He gives us his word so that we can use that as a guide. And if we follow that as close as we can, we can get to A to B a lot quicker but I know my, my own, in my own life, I spent 25 years doing my own thing. And, um, and, I, and I came to the place where it really wasn't working for me. And so I was introduced to the word. And then I set my, my path straighter. So I, if I would have just come to a knowledge of truth today, now that I'm just about, you know, really old, uh, I would have went down a lot of trails and wasted a lot of time in my life, and I would never get to the position that I am now in because I came to a knowledge many, many years ago. So I was able to get to be to where I am right now. Uh, not that I've arrived, of course, but I've got to the place where I am now. If I would have waited and made some bad mistakes, I may never got to be. The fact of the matter is, the Jewish people could have got 
here, but they made some real bad decisions. And so what happened was they, they took some detours all the way along the road. And, you know, we had good kings. We had bad kings. They went back and forth, real bad decisions. And, and then uh, Messiah came. The Messiah came. It tells us in Isaiah chapter 5 that he came and he was looking for some fruit, some good fruit, and all he found was bad fruit. And he said, he ended up saying, what more could I have done for my vineyard? So all along from the time of Abraham, God is leading his vineyard and it's taking left turns, right turns, more left turns than they are right turns. And they never got to their destination. However, if they would have went straight, if, if, David was, if David was faithful, Solomon was faithful, all the kings that followed them were faithful, they would have never went on these detours. Are you with me? God gave the prophecies in a way that he told them what would happen if they didn't go this way. He told them all the pitfalls. They'll go into captivity. They'll do this. Just because he said they were going to go into captivity doesn't mean it was God ordained. It was their choice, and he warned them they would go into captivity. Now, there are prophecies in the Old Testament that if Israel would have been faithful, then they would have accepted the Messiah. And people say, well, no, that's not possible. They couldn't accept the Messiah because he had to die. That's right. The Messiah had to die. But he didn't need to get executed outside the city as a criminal. If they would have accepted the Messiah, then they wouldn't have executed him as a criminal. He would have been the Lamb of God that was slain from the foundation of the world. Just like John said, behold the Lamb of God. Well, the sanctuary service told them how a Lamb of God was to be slain. And so the story of Abraham and Isaac, Yeshua says, Abraham saw my day and he rejoiced. He saw his day in the sacrifice of his son on Mount Moriah, which is exactly where the altar of sacrifice was. It was on Mount Moriah, the very spot that Abraham had taken Isaac. That was God's plan. So if, if Israel would have fulfilled God's plan the way he had laid it out, not only in prophecy, but in the sanctuary service, the temple in Jerusalem would be standing today. There would have been no reason to have it destroyed by Titus. In fact, it, the Solomon's temple would probably be standing if they would remain faithful in the time of Jeremiah. There's no way God would have allowed the nations to come in and destroy that temple. Are you following my reasoning? Yeah. The destruction of Solomon's temple was not God's plan for Israel. That house, as was promised would be where he would put his name forever. He would put his name forever there only if the people recognized him forever. It was a covenant relationship. If one part of the covenant was broken, if one party of the covenant broke the covenant, then the covenant was null and void. God had said he would never break his covenant. And that's true. He never did. The problem was with the people. They broke the covenant. And an all-knowing God that makes a covenant with sinful men has a way of getting out of the covenant. And that's if sinful men break the covenant. God didn't break the covenant with Israel. God still has a covenant with Israel. The question is, who's Israel? That's really the question. So people are thinking they're over, you know, over in the land of Israel, thinking that's God's Israel and the restoration of Jerusalem in the land and, 
and they're all going to come together and all the 10 or 12 tribes are going to come there and that's going to be the fulfillment of these promised prophecies of Jeremiah. But those prophecies, for the most part, were prophecies of them going back from the land after their captivity. So Satan has taken those prophecies and twisted them because people don't understand how he uses prophecy. Satan uses prophecy as well. And he's taken them and twisted them for what purpose? For the purpose of setting himself up in a temple, declaring himself that he is God. That's the whole setting of what's going on. And so all of this is revealed in Scripture. God has revealed the enemy's plan as well as his own plan. So in these prophecies, just what we read tonight, God said at the end of the 70 years, at the end of the 70 years, you're going to return to the land. And then you just keep reading within the same prophecy. And lo and behold, we run smack into the second coming. How does that work? How does that work? Well, let's explore this concept for a second. John the Baptist, when John the Baptist was preaching, he, he was reading these prophecies. And he was thinking that Yeshua was going to cleanse the, his threshing floor and burn it with the unquenchable fire. That's the words of John. And so John was under the same impression that the Messiah would come and he would set up the kingdom here on earth. Well, lo and behold, that's what people are preaching today. He's coming back to set up his kingdom because that's the way the prophecies read. However, when we get to the book of Revelation, we see a completely different picture. Is we see that the, the saved are taken. We see this in chapter 6 and 7 uh, at the second coming. He he, there's a resurrection there. And he takes them to the heavenly Jerusalem where they spend a thousand years. And then they come back here on earth. So all the promises that God said, the forever things, anytime you can read a forever thing, there will be peace forever, and the nations, you know, um, will come in, and my house will be a house of prayer for all nations. This is not going to be fulfilled until the end of the millennium. And the reason is, is because of the rejection of the Messiah. Had they accepted the Messiah, Jerusalem, the temple, Solomon's temple, had they not gone into captivity, would still be there today, and it would be a house of prayer for all nations. We would see all nations flooding into Jerusalem. Now, when the Messiah shows up, when he shows up and dies as the Lamb of God, as specified in the sanctuary service, and when he's resurrected, this would take the interest of the whole world. And so things would have been completely different. However, there would always be, and this is where I'm going to answer your question, there would always be a final battle against evil. And that's the Gog and Magog battle. So back in Ezekiel, if you actually compare the Gog and Magog battle in Ezekiel, it appears to me that that would be the way it would finish up had they accepted the Messiah. But because they didn't accept the Messiah, there's still going to be a final battle with evil, but it's not going to happen until after the millennium. This is the same thing we see. We see exactly the same picture in Zechariah chapter 14. There are some similarities of Zechariah chapter 14 in the book of Revelation in chapter 20 and 21. Some very close parallels. Uh, however, they're just a little bit different. One of the things we see in Ezekiel, where you get to, I think it's the last chapter in Ezekiel, where it talks about the names on the gates of Jerusalem. It's different than the names on the gates 
of Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem that comes down in, in the book of Revelation. So my question is why? Well, that's because we don't have Dan. So had Dan not, not gone his own way, he's not on the names of the New Jerusalem, of the gates in the New Jerusalem, and that's because there was a prophecy back in uh, chapter 48, I believe, of Genesis, where Dan, would, it says, would judge his people, and he would, be, he would bite at the rider's heels. So, and that's not a good, good thing. We're told not to judge. Dan, Dan was uh, judging his own people. And uh, yeah, the name means uh, God is judge, actually. But Dan took that upon himself, and he was biting at the heels of the riders that were in front of him, which is, in my uh, understanding, that would be kind of like backbiting. And uh, so he never ended up on, on the gates of the New Jerusalem. And I think that's significant. So, um, so anyways, so my, the answer to my question, it, are there going to be two Gog and Magog wars? So if Ezekiel uh, chapter 38 and 39, where the Gog and Magog war is, is that the same as the Revelation? I would say no, but... The, the point of them would be the same. If Israel had, had gone from A to B directly or more directly, then Ezekiel is how it would have been played out. The temple of, of Ezekiel should have been built, actually. That, that uh, prophecy of the temple in, in Ezekiel was given to Ezekiel while he was in captivity. That was the temple they were supposed to build when they came back from the captivity. However, when those that saw the old temple, they wept because it was not anything compared to Solomon's temple. But the Ezekiel temple would have uh, outshone even Solomon's temple, but they didn't build it. And so it's interesting that Solomon's temple was blessed by God uh, having fire come down on it. But we don't see that story with the Zerubbabel temple that was the second temple that was built. So, so Israel really, um, really didn't fulfill God's plan the way he asked them to do it. And that's led to the whole plan of salvation. Uh, God working through history uh, according to the willingness. And this, is, this to me shows... Um, the incredible patience and love of God for his creation. He, he works with man and allows him to really create his own destiny. Um, and our lives would be a lot better if we followed him. But he's worked with us. He's worked with human beings all through history to get them from A to B, even though they have taken him on detours all the way along. He could have went from A to B, no problem there, but he follows them through history to try and get them all the time to turn around and come back to get onto his plan, to end up as, at his destination. And, and so, yeah, that's a long-winded answer to your question. But I, 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 um, as I'm looking at these prophecies, I'm seeing things in them. And Malachi chapter 3 is a classic example of another prophecy. Malachi chapter 3 talks about, um, talks about when the Messiah would come, there would be a voice, uh, a messenger of the covenant, and then the, it says the, um, let, me, let me just get it. I don't want to misquote this because this is pretty kind of important part. Just grab your Bibles for a moment. Uh, I've, I've shared this before, um, but it kind of pertains to what we're talking about as well. I've asked people, where do you put this prophecy? 
And it really confuses people <laughs> because they really don't know where. And, and the, um, the best answer I've got, which is completely the wrong answer, uh, but the best answer I got, I'll, I'll share it with you. So, in Malachi chapter 3, here's a prophecy. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before, uh, before me. So, this is, this is the same thing in Isaiah where it talks about the messenger. Um, this is talking about John the Baptist. And that's the messenger. He will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. It's extremely interesting here. If we put, if we actually dissect this. So John the Baptist is preaching in the wilderness, saying, saying prepare the way of the Lord, make its path straight. He's doing all this stuff that he's supposed to do. And so people are coming to him and they're saying, are you the guy? Are you the Messiah? He says, oh, no, 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 no. I'm not even worthy to undo his sandals. Uh, so John was a pretty holy kind of guy. His father was a priest. He's out there preaching righteousness, telling people to repent because the Messiah is on his way. And, and then it says here, the Lord will suddenly, uh, the Lord whom you seek will, will suddenly come to his temple. In the, in the Gospel of John, in the first few chapters, the first thing Yeshua does when he starts his ministry, he goes to his temple. He suddenly goes to his temple. Well, what does he do in his temple? He cleanses it. He cleanses it at the beginning of his ministry as a fulfillment of this prophecy. But they never accepted him as the fulfillment of this prophecy they rejected him. But here's what would have happened. So in the prophecies, God has shown what would have happened had they done what they were supposed to do. And that's what people don't quite get in the prophecies, is that God has, if you take this road, it's going to end up here. But if you take that road, it's going to end up at another place. And so God gave inside the prophecies the good way, and he also said what would happen if you didn't. So we're going to read right here what would have happened had they accepted uh, what God had, had wanted to do for them. It says, And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant. This is the promised Messiah that would come from Jeremiah, Isaiah, and all these other different prophecies. Even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says Jehovah of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and a fuller's soap. Sounds like somebody that's coming to cleanse, right? He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. He will purify who? Who does it say here? Sons of Levi. The sons of Levi. Who are the sons of Levi? Aaron's sons. They were Aaron's sons, but what was their job? They were the priests. Right, exactly. So when he came, when John the Baptist was preaching, and the Lord suddenly came to his temple, they didn't recognize him as the Lord, but he suddenly came as a fulfillment of what John was preaching in his day. He came to his temple, and he came to purify the sons of Levi. He cleansed the temple. He wasn't cleansing the temple. He was cleansing the people that were in control of the temple. He flushed them out. They all took, took running. They were afraid. So he was going to fulfill, he was fulfilling this prophecy in Malachi. And it says, he will sit as a refiner, a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them, refine them as gold and silver. That's what he was doing when he took that whip 
and he was driving them out. He was cleansing the temple. Purged them as gold and silver that, that, or so that, they may offer to Jehovah an offering of righteousness. So if it says that he was going to purify them so that they could, so that they would make a righteous offering, doesn't that mean that the offerings that they were making were not righteous? Mm-hmm. Does that make yes. sense? Yeah. Yes. Right. That's really why he enough. came to pure them, because God was not accepting their offerings at the temple. And, and so this is a prophecy. So what would have happened now had they accepted? Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasant to Jehovah, as in the days of old, as in former years. And I will come near you for judgment and I will be a swift witness against sorcerers, against adulterers, against perjurers, against those who exploit wage earners and widows uh, and the fatherless, and against those who turn away the a- an alien because they do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. So, so here we have a prophecy of John the Baptist preaching of uh, the Messiah coming, And he would cleanse the house, which he did, but they rejected his cleansing. They continued to offer offerings of unrighteousness because they didn't accept the purification. My question is, could they have accepted the purification and submitted themselves to Yeshua? Yes. Absolutely. Had they done that, the blessings that followed would have happened. But because they wouldn't accept the cleansing, the blessings in the promised prophecies were not fulfilled. And Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel are full of these kinds of prophecies. So people have a hard time discerning whether those promised prophecies are for fulfillment in today because they weren't fulfilled back then. So I asked somebody about this prophecy. And they said, oh, that's when Yeshua is going to return. That's why we need a temple at the second coming because Yeshua is going to purify them and then we're going to live on earth and we're going to offer sacrifices all through the millennium because now we have a pure house. And I'm going, oh my, you've got to be kidding here. And, and, uh, and so people are just, they're hopeless. It's, they're, they're just not seeing the concept that God mingled the everlasting promises of the eternal kingdom where peace would reign throughout all eternity because God gave those within the other conditions of what he was going to do, i.e. the return from the captivity. So God blended the return from the captivity with the ultimate promises. And that kind of makes sense. You know, it's kind of like when you tell your child, you know, you work hard in school and you know what? One day you're going to be a lawyer and you're going to make lots of money. And I'm not saying that that's what you're going to tell your child, but you give you give things that have to do with today and you work hard at what you're supposed to do today and you follow my counsel today and you know what, down the road, it's going to be wonderful. And so the, provi- or the prophecies are full of that kind of stuff. So now people are taking the wonderful part and saying, well, that's all going to start happening at when Yeshua returns, and we're going to have a kingdom on earth, and you know we're going to reign the nations, and we're all going to sit on thrones. And, and it's just like, it's just, wow. Um, we don't understand how the prophecies are all put together. So you, the answer to your question is um, the Gog and Magog war. I believe that Gog and Magog war... Uh, would have happened uh, would have happened at a different time 
and in a, but in a similar way, way. There always has had to be a war to rid the, the world of evil. And evil would have to be destroyed. Ultimately, that includes Satan and his angels and all evil would have to be uh, totally consumed and destroyed for God to get on with his plan and bring in everlasting righteousness. And as we read uh, Daniel chapter 9, that's what the 490-year uh, prophecy was all about. Those were the conditions. Those were the conditions that the Jews had for the 77s to bring in. And we could read that too. Let's turn there to read that. Had the Jews fulfilled these things, which they could have, uh, if they would have accepted the Messiah, things would have been a lot different. You see, God gives us free will. He gives nations free will. And uh, he, he allows them to make the choices. And then he works with the mess after the choice. Uh, Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. Daniel 9... Verse 24, this was when Daniel was grappling with the books of Jeremiah, the coming of the Messiah, the return from the captivity, and all these things, uh, he was told by Gabriel that 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. Okay, so now he's, now he's getting some, some context on Jeremiah, the prophecies that he's studying. And, and they were to do these things. They were to finish transgression. In other words, quit going sideways. Get it, you know, do what you need to do to get on the right, uh, right side of history. To make an end of sins. So they were finished transgression. To make an end of sins. To, bring, to make reconciliation for iniquity. To bring in what? Everlasting righteousness. The Jews could have actually brought in everlasting righteousness had they chose to do that. But they chose to reject the one that could bring everlasting righteousness, and they crucified him. And uh, that would have sealed up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. We know the story. They rejected that. So all those promised prophecies were postponed. And that's why we have the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation would have never been written had the Jews uh, fulfilled their role as a nation. And somebody might say, well, then the Jews are bad people and all that kind of stuff. Well, if I was living back then, I might have done the same thing. The thing is, today, we've got to learn the lessons of the past and not repeat them so we can get on the right side of things here at the time of the end. So... Any questions on any of that? I know there's, uh, you know, I just kind of went off there for a little bit, but uh, any questions on any of that? Any Anywhere that doesn't make sense or or what? I have a, a comment, not a question for yet, but just wondering, um, maybe sometime I or we could go through and put on one side all the prophecies that um, if if they had obeyed, Israel had obeyed, then it would have turned out like this. And then if, since they didn't, it's going to turn out like this. On yeah, the that's, side of the that's, that's interesting. Yeah, that's a good exercise. Do you want to start that? Sure. Why yeah. don't we, for those of you that that would like to look more into that, why don't you just, as you're studying, um, just start making notes. That's what I kind of do. Um, you know, somebody, when I first heard about the, the Godhead and, and that there wasn't three or four or five, you know, gods, um, I, I didn't pursue it as a study per se, because it wasn't really on my mind to do it. I didn't really have the conviction to look at it. Um, but as I was studying, when somebody told me about it, as I was studying, I would, I would come into a text and I'd think, oh, okay, that's where that goes. So I would kind of file it 
and, and then um, after a while I found, wow, there's quite a bit of evidence for uh, the lack of a trinity. So I don't know if we have any Trinitarians in this room, but um, if we do, we'll have to deal with that one day. But, um, but anyways, I, I learned over time that, that that just doesn't seem to be the way it is. Okay, that's, that's good. So anyone that wants to do that, maybe we, we can um, have that study. As you're reading through Jeremiah and Isaiah, you're going to see lots of places um, where the timing of events is very, very unclear. And that's where people get, uh, get lost in prophecy, is, is God doesn't show the when of things. He just gives you the promise, but not of the when. Okay. Well, I'd like to add, too, you were back in Ezekiel a little earlier. Everyone wants to take the two sticks of Ezekiel and bring the two tribes together. Right. And they want to put that in the end times. That was so clearly when they were coming out of Babylon. Right. Yeah, you've probably heard of that, Ephraim, and, and then bring oh, yeah. the two sticks sure to the house of Israel. That's a big teaching in the Messianic world, and they're saying all oh, that's happening right now. And as soon as the 12 tribes come back together, then that's proof that those prophecies are fulfilled. That was a prophecy that, that was given to Ezekiel that, the tri that God's plan for Israel was the whole of Israel would come together and, uh, and be there worshiping at the time that the Messiah would come. And, and that, was, that was the plan. Um, but we're lifting those prophecies out and saying, oh no, now they're being fulfilled. And that's, that's the plan of the enemy, is to get us to misread these prophecies. And we've got to be extremely careful when it comes, because one of the reasons why the Jews were, were um, brought to nothing, if you will, at 70 AD, was because they were not reading the prophecies correctly. And the false prophets have always twisted the prophecies. So this is... This is a lesson that we need to be so, so careful here in the time of the end that we don't get lost in, in the lies of what these are uh, the fulfillments of prophecy. Okay, so let's, um, I, I want to take a tiny bit of a detour here because I think that we can learn uh, some lessons here. Just before we get to, to Jeremiah chapter 29, which talks about the uh, 70 years again, um, and it's quite interesting how it brings it out, but I want to I pick up in chapter 27 because I believe there's some very good lessons uh, for us here um, in chapter 27. So let's... Um, and if there's something that jumps out at you, anyone, that something that jumps out at you, let's, let's hear it because uh, the Spirit may very well be uh, sharing with you something that we all need to hear. So if you see something as we read through, and I'll make some comments as we go, things that I've, I've noticed um, as we go too. So 27, Dale, I'm looking at you. You're in my top left corner of the screen. Do you want to read um, first five verses, four or five verses? Sure. In the beginning of the reign of Yehokim, son of Yashayahu, the sovereign of Yehuda, this word came to Jeremiah from Yah, saying, This is what Yah said to me Make for yourselves bands and yokes, then you shall put them on your neck and shall send them to the sovereign of Edom, and the sovereign of Moab, and the sovereign of the Ammonites, and the sovereign of Tesor, and the sovereign of Zidon, by the hand of the messengers who come to Jerusalem to, I'm not sure what that word is, uh, I'll take a Yahoo, the sovereign of Yehuda. And you shall command them to say their masters, thus says Yah of hosts, the Elohim of Israel, say this to your masters. I have made the earth, the man, and the beast that are on the face of the earth, 
by my great power and by my outstretched arm, and I shall give it to whom it seemed right in my eyes. Okay, so this, I've got, I've got a date here, and, and some of these dates might vary just a little bit because, you know, they're doing their best they can in history. Sometimes I wonder if they, they get it exactly right, but um, approximate, the approximate dating for this chapter, I've got different, different uh, dates in here. Does anyone have a date for that chapter? No? Okay. I've got anywhere have, from... What's that? I have, I have uh, for this chapter, I have, it's in Jeremiah yeah. 27, um, 597 B.C. Okay. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty close. Have you got that new Bible? Is that what you're using? Y yes, I'm using the Thompson. Okay, okay. Yeah, that's, that's the dating that mine says as well. You'll find different dates, um, but they're all pretty close. So this is after the first captivity um, when Daniel was taken. So this is, this is the, the word of the Lord that came to Jeremiah. And he's telling them, he's telling these kings to make yokes and to put them on their neck because they were going to serve the king of Babylon. So Nebuchadnezzar, when he came to Jerusalem, he, that wasn't the only time, only time he was going to take control. He came back in, I believe, about 586 and actually destroyed, the, that's when he destroyed the temple. He allowed them to have their temple in 605, and they kept operating it until, uh, I believe it was 586. So there was still warning that Jeremiah was given he was giving, Jeremiah remained in Jerusalem, and he was still counseling those that were still in Jerusalem that weren't taken captive at the first captivity in 605. So he was telling them, you know, you guys be good boys and everything will be fine. Uh, but obviously we know what happened and they weren't. So, um, so someone else pick up on that. And who's next? Dan. You're next on my screen. Pick it up at verse 6, if you would. And now I have given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant. And the beasts of the field I have also given him to serve him. So all nations shall serve him and his son and his son's son until the time of his land comes. And then many nations and great kings shall make him serve them. And it shall be that the nation and kingdom, which will not serve Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and which will not put its neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon, that nation I will punish, says Yahweh, with the sword, the famine, and the pestilence, until I have consumed them by his hand. Therefore, do not listen to your prophets, your diviners, your dreamers, your soothsayers, or your sorcerers who speak to you, saying, You shall not serve the king of Babylon, for they prophesy a lie to you, to remove you far from your land, and I will drive you out, and you will perish. Okay. Anything, anything there somebody want to discuss? Okay, so we have the superpower is going to rule over all these nations, and we have God's prophet in Israel telling them that they're going to have to serve them. This is kind of interesting. So God's prophet is actually telling people that don't have the God of Israel as their God what's going to be happening. This is kind of, kind of interesting because we have that ability today. We have the ability to tell people what's coming down. And, um, and the reason is, the reason why that's important for us to do that 
is because we're told in the Bible that God knows the end from the beginning, from ancient times, things that have not yet been done. So if we're listening to what God is speaking to us today, he's revealing things that are going to happen in the future, which when people understand that we know the future, uh, we're not like the soothsayers, we actually know what's coming. And when we share that ahead of time, and when people see that stuff come to pass, they're going to be um, forced to have a look. And that's, that's kind of the purpose of prophecy, is so that when it comes to pass, people will be, will be uh, more apt to take notice of what God is doing uh, and his word. So let's move on in... Uh, did you get to verse 11? Yeah, 10. Okay. And Anthony. Starting at verse 11. But, okay. But the nations that bring their neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serve him, those will I let remain still in their own land, saith the Lord, and they shall till it and dwell therein. I speak. I spoke also to Zedekiah, king of Judah, according to all these words, saying, Bring your necks under the yoke of the king of Babylon, and serve him as his people, and live. Why will ye die, um, thou and thy people, by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence, as the Lord has spoken against a nation that will not serve the king of Babylon? Therefore, hearken not unto the words of the prophets that speak unto you, saying, You shall not serve the king of Babylon, for they prophesy a lie unto you. For I have not sent them, saith the Lord. Yet they prophesy a lie in my name, that I may drive you out, and that ye might perish, ye and the prophets that prophesy unto you. Also I speak to the priests and to all this people saying, Thus saith the Lord. Hearken not to the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you, saying, Behold, the vessels of the Lord's house shall now shortly be brought again from Babylon, where they prophesy a lie unto you. Hearken not unto them. Serve the king of Babylon and live. Wherefore should this city be laid waste? But it is they, but if they be prophets, and if the word of the Lord be with them, let them now make intercession to the Lord of hosts that the vessels which are left in the house of the Lord and in the house of the king of Judah and at Jerusalem go not to Babylon. Okay, let's stop there. That's good. Right. Thank you. Um, okay, now there are some things in there, um, especially in the context of you know, what we had up on the board that we want to take a little peek at. Um, anyone, anyone want to bring anything out of those verses? Did you notice anything? Don't listen to lying prophets. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, but specifically in, in the first verses that we were looking at, is the the diviners it was in verse 19 or in verse 9 so your diviners your dreamers your soothsayers and your sorcerers who speak to you saying you shall not serve the king of babylon so these are the people of the world that are saying what's going to happen so there's two groups here now he moves into the the people of israel and the king of israel and now he's telling the priests, those that minister, that were still ministering at the temple at that time, he's telling them not to listen to their prophets. These are the prophets of the house of Israel. These are the ones that were the wannabe prophets, the ones that claimed to be prophets, the ones that declared themselves to be prophets. And, and Jeremiah said, don't listen to them. They're lying to you. And the thing is, they're speaking in the name of, what does it say in verse, um, 
Verse 15, for I have not sent them, says the Lord, yet they prophesy a lie in whose name? In Mine. his name. Ah, wow. We, Sounds like what's going on today. <laughs> we cannot miss this. We cannot miss this. Just because people are speaking in the name of Jehovah or Yahweh or however you want to pronounce it makes no difference to me. Is not proof that they're speaking for God. If we miss that point, we're going to go down roads right. that lead to nowhere. And that's exactly what Yeshua said. And Yeshua said exactly the same thing. Many will come and, in my name, and, and they will lead many astray. And he talks about false prophets. The thing is, we don't learn. We think we've learned the lessons of the past, and we'll never make those same mistakes. But history tells us that we continue to repeat the lessons of the past. And really, the lesson that we learn from the past is that we don't learn the lessons of the past. We know that. And so we arrive at 2024, and we say, we're not as stupid as them. We would never have rejected Yeshua had, he, had we would have been there. Well, I got news for everyone. Yeah, we'd probably do exactly the same thing. Unless we learn the lessons, we will do the same thing. So, evidently, at the time of Jeremiah... They were listening to the false prophets. And we're going to get into the little bit of a story on what the false prophets are saying here, which is really quite interesting. So the false prophets were in direct conflict with what Jeremiah was saying. Exactly conflict with what Jeremiah was saying. And we can expect the same thing to be going on today. So uh, let's... Um, where did we get to? Um, 19, I think. Okay. So, so it says here, the other thing that I wanted to bring out in verse 19, or verse 18, but if they are prophets, if they are prophets, and if the word of the Lord is with them, then let them now make intercession to the Lord of hosts, that the vessels which are left in the house of the Lord, see the house of the Lord was still standing, in the house of the king of Judah and at Jerusalem, do not go to Babylon. Doesn't that seem to indicate that had they obeyed, the house of the Lord would not have been destroyed? Yes. Absolutely. How different would have things been if the temple of Solomon was standing to this day? Do you think that there would be purpose in Satan to have Solomon's temple destroyed? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. His extension of life depended on them having that temple destroyed. And so he did everything he could uh, to infiltrate the system of God's people so that they would rebel so that Solomon's temple would be destroyed. That was Satan's plan. And, and lo and behold, it worked. And so... The temple got built again after the captivity, and lo and behold, he was successful again, and lo and behold, the temple was destroyed. It's history repeats itself, and we're going to get the same story coming down the pipe again today, only this time, God has forsaken the Jews and Israel of the flesh and he has moved forward with the New Testament church, which, according to Paul, were Israel. So the Israel of old is not the Israel of today. The Israel of today 
was in the form of the New Testament church that was led by the disciples. And so now I ask, has the New Testament church repeated the history of the past? They have apostatized yes. just like Israel of old did. Nothing's changed. They never learned. The, the church of the New Testament went into apostasy just a couple hundred years after, uh, well, actually almost 75 years after the last apostle um, uh, died, after John died. It was not even into the at the end of the second century, that they were starting to go um, by the wayside, and they were repeating the, the history of ancient Israel. Modern Israel had followed the path of ancient Israel, just as they'd done over the years, over the years. Okay, so, um, so this is uh, where we're at. So they could have changed history had they accepted um, what Jeremiah was trying to tell them. If the false prophets got on track and started teaching the right things and Israel started to obey and surrendered to Babylon, then they would have been able to continue worshiping at the uh, temple in Jerusalem. That's what Jeremiah was trying to say. Okay, let's, let's keep going here. Um, who is... Next on my yeah, screen, wait. Kathleen, uh, do you want to pick it up on verse 19? Sure. For thus says the Lord of hosts concerning the pillars, concerning the sea, concerning the carts, and concerning the remainder of the vessels that remain in the city, which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, did not take. <clears throat> when he carried away captive um, Jacon Jaconiah, um, the son of Je Jehoiakim, uh, king of Judah, from Jerusalem to Babylon, and all the nobles of Judah and Jerusalem. Okay, I just want to yes. I just want to say here to qualify, and you you probably know this, but I just wanted to bring this in. Jeremiah, there's a good chance Jeremiah had no idea who Daniel was. And so his name is not mentioned here, uh, but Daniel would have known Jeremiah because Jeremiah was a prophet that preached downtown Jerusalem. So Daniel would have been fully aware of who Jeremiah was, but Jeremiah probably didn't know who Daniel was. And Daniel would have been included in that captivity that's mentioned here, and he was one of the nobles of Judah. And Jerusalem. So he's included in that bunch. So that was taken at the first captivity, and then now is uh, Jeremiah's warning them that, look, you guys still have the temple, you still have the utensils, you still have all this stuff, but it's all going to be taken if you guys don't repent. And that's really what's going on here. So go ahead, uh, read a couple more verses. Yes, thus says the Lord of hosts, Jehovah of Israel, concerning the vessels that remain in the house of the Lord and in the house of the king of Judah and of Jerusalem. They shall be carried to Babylon, and, they, and there they shall be until the day that I visit them, says the Lord. Then I will bring them up and restore them to this place. Right. So there's, there's the prophecy. If they're disobedient, they won't be taken. That's what we saw in verse 18. But if they don't repent, they will be taken. So it's a choice. They had a fork in the road. What are they going to do? So now the false prophets go to work. And that's what we're going to see. So let's keep going here. Uh, Les. Okay. Chapter 28. Yes. And it happened, 
in the same year at the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the fourth year and in the fifth month, that Hananiah, the son of Azur, uh, the prophet who was from Gideon, spoke to me in the house of the Lord, in the presence of the priests and of all the people, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, I have spoken the yoke, for I have broken the, the yoke of the king of Babylon. Within two full years I will bring back to this place all the vessels of the Lord's house that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took away from this place and carry to Babylon. And I will break, or I will bring back to this uh, place Jehoiak, Jeconiah, the son of uh, Jehoiakim, king of Judah, with all the captives of Judah who, uh, who went to <laughs> Babylon, says the Lord, for I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. Okay, let's stop there. You see a problem here? This is, this is somebody that calls himself a prophet. This is somebody that was recognized as a prophet. He's in direct conflict with what Jeremiah was saying. Jeremiah was saying it's going to be 70 years. This guy says within two full years, everything's coming back. The captives are coming back. He is directly butting heads in the name He's quoting in the name of the Lord. So this actually should read, Thus speaks Jehovah of hosts, verse 2, the God of Israel, saying, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. This is in direct conflict with what Jeremiah is saying. Jeremiah is saying, this is the word of the Lord. This guy is saying, this is the word of the Lord. How do you know who's right? If you're sitting in the temple in Jerusalem, how do you know who's speaking the truth? That's a good question. You have to have the spirit of prophecy. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's a good answer. But here's, here's part of the thing with it. What do you want to believe? Mm -hmm. What would you like to believe? The shorter, the shorter uh, uh, sentence of two years. Nice. Nice. It, itchy ears. Yeah. Yeah. You can see why the false prophets have a more... Uh, favorable report amongst the people because they tell them what they want to hear. Yeah. Yeah. And so if you have a population that is groomed to believe a certain thing and the false prophets are preaching to that, that, that thing, whatever the concept is, then who are they going to accept? they're going to accept the false prophet because he's teaching to according to what the people have been accustomed or want to believe. And this is exactly where we're at today. Exactly where we're at today. Um, this, is, this is what's going on. This is, this is so closely fulfilling exactly the way it was in history that it's scary. It's actually scary. And... Um, I, I see this all the time, uh, what, I'm, what I'm looking at. And somebody might say, and I'm, I'm hoping not anyone here, but I know there's people saying, well, what makes you think that you got it right? Well, that's a very good question. Um, and, okay, so let's, let's, keep, let's keep going here. Irene. Irene, did you, Irene is reading next? Yeah. Okay. Then the prophet Jeremiah said to the prophet Hananiah, in the presence of the priest and in the presence of all people who stood in the house of Yahweh, even the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen. Yeah. Oh, stop. <laughs> stop, stop, stop. <laughs> okay, I, I'm sorry, you got to stop there. This is, 
this is one of the most classic things that a prophet, a true prophet, has ever done. He's got, he's got this false prophet that's making all these claims, all this good story. Everyone's coming home. Everyone's going to live happily ever after. And Jeremiah stands up and says, Amen! Preach it, brother! And I'm just going, wow, <laughs> that, that must have been really something when he did that. Uh, everyone's probably just cheering him on. Why would he do that? Why would Jeremiah? Yeah. <laughs> well, he didn't just stop there. Up. He didn't stop there, but he, I think he just wanted to, I think he wanted to really, uh, really shock them. There's another chapter, and I thought it was chapter 36. I'll, I'll find it. Um, I'll find it, and, and it's really interesting. Um, the king wanted Jeremiah to preach a certain thing and Jeremiah would not because they wanted him to preach the same thing that the false prophets were preaching um, because he said that it would go a lot better for him if he would do that and Jeremiah said no no I can only preach what God tells me to preach so <laughs> and so so we have this very extremely I think sarcastic amen by yeah. the prophet and so keep reading because what he says here is just fascinating. Jeremiah was just kind of telling him in, a, in his own way that he was a false prophet. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And he, he unpacks it here. So go ahead in verse 6 there, read that. The prophet Jeremiah said again, May Yahweh do so. May Yahweh confirm your words which you have prophesied to bring again the vessels of the house of Yahweh and all the exiles from Babylon into this place. But hear now this word that I speak in your ears and in the ears of all the people. The prophets who have been before me and before you from time past prophesied against many lands and against great kingdoms of war and of evil and of plague. As for the prophet who prophesies of peace, when the word of the prophet shall come to pass, the prophet shall be known as one whom Yahweh has truly sent him. Then Hananiah the prophet took the yoke from the prophet Jeremiah's neck and broke it. And Hananiah spoke for the eyes of the people, saying, So, says Yahweh, even so I will break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, from the neck of all nations, within the time of two years. And the prophet Jeremiah went his way. Okay, okay. Let's stop there. Let's, let's try and pick up the picture here. This is downtown Jerusalem at the temple. We've got, a, we've got a confrontation with the true prophet and the false prophets and the priests. And everyone is on the side of the false prophet. And you've got Jeremiah standing there all by himself that's declaring the word of the Lord. And so he, he gives them the bitter news and he was instructed to wear a yoke on his neck as a symbol that they were gonna be this yoke and they were gonna serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. And so this prophet comes and he takes the yoke off Jeremiah. So put yourself in Jeremiah's shoes here. He takes the yoke off Jeremiah's and he breaks it. And he says he's going to break the yoke of king of Babylon. And, uh, and then Jeremiah goes his way. So he walks out. But God doesn't leave him there. So uh, let's, let's keep going here. Now the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah after Hananiah the prophet had broken the yoke from the neck of the prophet Jeremiah, saying, Go and tell Hananiah, saying, Thus says the Lord, You have broken the yokes of wood, but you have made in their place yokes of iron. But thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have put a yoke of iron on the neck of all these nations, that they may serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and they shall serve him. I have given him the beasts of the field also. Then the prophet Jeremiah said to Hananiah the prophet, Hear now, Hananiah, the Lord has not sent you, but you make these people trust in a lie. Therefore thus says the Lord, Behold, I will cast you from the face of the earth, 
This year you shall die, because you have taught rebellion against the Lord. So Hananiah the prophet died the same year in the seven, seventh month. Oh. Okay. What happens in the seventh month? Judgment. Yeah. Judgment. Wow. No coincidence there. Um, this is this is what people don't understand today. We are worshiping and we are following to the best of our ability the same God that was working back here. This is the same God that brought judgment down on Ananias and Sapphira in front of the New Testament church. Executed them right in front of Peter and all those that were there. We're not, this is not a game that we're in. This is for like all the marbles. Everything that we do is very serious when it comes to God's word. So if we don't get it right, and this is, you know, I, I, I really have to be careful how I say this because it's because there's an enemy that's trying to destroy us. If we don't get it right, the enemy is going to get into our house and make a real mess. And so that's why it's really important that we stay as best we can on the straight and narrow, keep our heads in the word, and out of the false prophets. So it becomes very important for us to recognize a false prophet when we see one. Jeremiah recognized a false prophet when he saw one because he had the Spirit of God working in him. And so he recognized the, uh, the false prophets immediately. And, and this is what we've got to be so in tune with the Spirit and, uh, and that's the only way that we're going to recognize the people that are lying in the name of the Lord. And believe me, there are many. Um, there are many. Okay, so. Tom, in verse 13, it says, Go tell Ananias, saying, Yahweh, you have broken yokes of wood but you shall make instead of them yokes of iron. I know there's a significance between the yoke of wood and yoke of iron, Yeah. but I can't get it wrapped around my head. Can you explain the wood and the iron? Well, yeah, they're made obviously of two different things. Um, that God used a yoke of oxen to, to make a point. And, and Hananiah, the false prophet, could break those. With his human strength, he could break them. And uh, God says, well, uh, I'm going to give you yokes of iron, and you will not be able to break them. So it's in our human wisdom we think we can overrule what God is doing, but we will be put into circumstances where we will not be able to get out of the punishment that God will pronounce upon us if we go the wrong way. And that is relating more to the punishment that God is going to put on us? Yeah, we, will, we won't be able to get out of it. It's, it's going Absolutely. to happen. Okay. Okay, any other comments before we finish up? And next week we'll be able to get into Jeremiah chapter 29. Our Heavenly Father, we just want to say thank you for tonight and letting us all come together and and study your word and hear your word. And Father, we just ask that our hearts be open <clears throat> and that we just seek you with all our heart. We just thank you for your son, Yeshua, and the salvation that he gave us. And I thank you for all our brothers and sisters that are with us tonight. And I ask your protection over us in the days and the years to come. We pray this in your holy son's name. Amen. 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 Well, thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. And uh, we'll you. see you if you can join us on Sabbath and either that or next Wednesday night. Until then, have a good week.